You ever had a real conversation about money without having to talk about bills or your cousin Ray Ray's latest pyramid scheme? Before we were emancipated in 1863, we had 0.5% of the nation's national wealth. Today, in 2020, over 150 plus years later, we've only amassed a half of a percent. That's right. Today, we only have 1% of the nation's wealth. I think it's well past due we have to talk about money. <music> Lessons. This is Ibuebe Shange of the Crypto World Financial Sustainability Movement, where I show you alternative financial building methodologies that enable you to live off your savings and investments. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that bell so you'll be notified when new videos are posted. Also, want to give a salute to Sister Knight and the TBT gang for the work that they're doing and allowing us to be on their platform as well. So, I want to start today out with figuring out what type of thinker you are. There's three types of thinkers. There's the literal, the inferential, and the evaluative. Now, the literal thinker is the one that takes everything, basically, whatever you say, face value, without question. For instance, if I tell you that the sky is purple, you know, you're not going to question me because, one, I'm a person of authority. And usually these are your teachers, your doctors, uh, your parents, or your pastors. So when they tell you something, you accept it without question. The inferential thinker is the one that takes in information, and even though it doesn't sit well with them, they're not yet equipped to come back with an alternative. And the evaluative thinker, which I hope that we all aspire to be, is that type of thinker that takes that information, for instance, someone tell you that the sky is purple, and they do their diligence to come back and counter and say, hey, look, the sky isn't purple, it's actually blue, and this is the reason why. So this is that person that's not afraid to challenge authority. So whatever we talk about, especially when it comes to finances, there's a lot of information out there, but we haven't asked the right questions, and we're kind of afraid to ask those people that are giving that information out. Well, with the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement, I want to leave this avenue open for you to have questions and also challenge the things that I put out there because all in all, we're trying to get free. So Harry Truman once said, there's nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. And if there's one thing that I know we don't really know enough about, is about finances. Hawaiians are the most consumptive race on the planet. It's one of the main reasons that we as a race don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw out of. Now, what I mean by Pawatis is an acronym. Pawatis means people of African descent in the United States. And the reason why I say that is because when we say African American, we're excluding the other Africans that, of diasporic Africans that live in this country. It could be some from the Caribbean, some from uh, Europe, some from Africa, the motherland itself. So when I'm speaking about these issues, I'm talking about us collectively, because that's collectively, the world sees us that way, but we don't. So with me using that term of Pawatis, the issues we're dealing with is about us collectively. And even Martin Luther King said this at one point. All too often when there is a mass unemployment in the black community, it's referred to as a social problem. And when there is mass unemployment in the white community, it's referred to as a depression. But what if I told you this was systemically done by design? Across every socioeconomic level, Pawatis have significantly less wealth than whites. Over one-third of Pawatis families have either negative wealth or no net worth at all. For every $100 a white family has, Pawatis have $5.04. And we think about the last recession that happened between 2007 and 2009. Pawatis communities were hit the hardest, losing more than half of our net worth. We went from $12,000 per median household to $5,600, whereas whites only losing 10% of their net worth went from $135,000 to $110,000. So in the same breath of talking about recessions, many aren't aware that they are systemically planned and happen in cycles anywhere between every 10 to 12 years. So we're actually approaching a, a recession right now. But they have the power to disrupt an economy or damage it significantly. The thing is we don't understand is that when a recession happens, the older you get, the more vulnerable your savings are. Imagine being two years away from retirement and a recession comes and you see your savings drop significantly, some 20%. Well, that's what happened in 2007 to 2009, the last recession, where we saw people lose not 20%, but 30% of their retirement savings, and it wasn't replenished. 
we saw the senior citizens age bracket lose $2.7 trillion in retirement savings. What situation did that put them in? Well, in most cases, uh, some of them, a lot of them lost their homes, uh, was unable to pay for their mortgages. Uh, so they had to foreclose and some even had to move in with their children. They weren't able to afford to pay for their doctor visits or their Medicare. Uh, and some even were fatal. Some even couldn't even live because of not having funds and lost their lives. The thing we have to realize is that the retirement savings system is broke. And because of that, there will be no rest retirement nest egg that we're accustomed to having. Winter's not coming, it's actually here. If you refer to my previous video, The End of the Grasshopper, I explain what that means. And because financial literacy is not a topic of conversation in our communities, we instead are told to invest in the 401k and stock platform, which has proven to show that there is not really that big of a return. So let's talk about the real of 401ks. What do they actually do? You know, 401k basically is an agreement that you have with your with the with the retirement system that you're going to put money away for 20 to 35 years, taking out of your paycheck. If you do decide to take out money before the age 59 and a half, you face massive penalties. And in some states like New York, you're taxed up to five times. And those monies that are pulled out within that year are fixed to your income. So for instance, if you're making $75,000 for the year and you pull out $15,000, you won't be taxed in the $75,000 bracket. You'll be actually taxed in the $90,000 bracket. So these are things that people don't really understand when they actually do try to pull out money. Here's the other issue is that we don't understand that the tax rate, we have no idea what the tax rate is going to be 30 years from now. The tax rate certainly will be much higher 30 years from now when it's time to retire, or even 10 years from now. So basically what we're doing is we're putting away money, but we have no idea the value of it when it comes time to take it out. The other thing is the employer match. And with the employer match, we're told, okay, if you put in 3%, then we'll match that with 3%. But what we don't know is the fine print is for every dollar that you contribute to your 401k, your employer contributes 99 cents less of your salary. So in essence, all they're really contributing is a penny. The other part of it is that we don't realize that you have to actually stay at your job for a certain amount of time for this to kick in. So even though in year one through five, you've been putting in money into your 401k and it's been matched by your employer, you have to stay at your job at least six years in order for it to be actually uh, for you to be able to pull that money out. But when we look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we find that the average American stays at their job 4.2 years. So that means they don't stay long enough, that six-year threshold, to be able to actually receive that contribution match from their employer. So where does that money go? It goes back to the company. So this is actually a way of them making money off of your investments. So where is your funds put into, put into when in a 401k? Well, it's invested in highly volatile funds. So if the market isn't doing well, well, the amount of money that you have in the market isn't doing well also. If it does good, then you'll get a rise. But the key here is to realize that the money that you have saved is predicated upon what's happening in the world. Uh, in February of this year, we saw that the stock market rose to an all-time high of over 29,500 points. But once COVID came, March 23rd, we saw the largest drop, dropping down to 18,600 points. And let's also debunk the myth that the market is where you can make all this money and you can get rich. When we think about it, the market, the average annual return is anywhere between 7 to 10%. But as an individual, over the last 40 years, individuals only net a gain of anywhere between 1% to 1.8%. That's the same as a banking account. And the reasons I speak about the dangers of 401ks is because most folks won't pull these funds out until it's time to retire. Well, as I mentioned, a recession can wipe it out and you not even know it. In the last recession, I lost $250,000 in my retirement savings. And me thinking this was just a fluke, not knowing the full nature of how 401k systems work with recessions, I just started putting money back in. That money that was lost wasn't replenished. So me starting all over again, I started to put money back into my contributions, and this time I actually doubled on them, thinking I need to catch up. But here's the issue. A recession can happen again. And the longer recessions happen or the later in your years in your working careers, the closer you are to retirement, the more susceptible your retirement savings are to being lost. So as I became a little bit more financially literate, I realized that these funds that are sitting there, it's probably better off for me to think about using it now than later. After all, money's sitting there for 30 years making money for them. 
Why not pull it out now and use it for myself and create my future? Let's talk briefly about the Social Security system, another retirement savings plan, right? Well, as of today, if you look at the ticker of the world debt clock, it says that we owe um, over $26 trillion. I've always wondered, well, who do we owe this money to? So if you do a little bit of, of fact finding, you'll find that as of May of 2019, $1.1 trillion is owed each to Japan and China. The remaining $900 billion is owed to Brazil, uh, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. So guess who the remaining $23 trillion is owed to? It's owed to us. And a lot of that money is put in the form of Social Security. Well, this money pot is also used to balance the federal budget. The U.S. Congress pulls out it consistently to pay for unfunded wars, tax cuts for the rich, and occasionally a bailout for us. So because this money is being continually dipped into and not replenished, it's estimated that by the year 2033, the Social Security system would be completely at zero. This is why I say this is by design, but it doesn't have to be your design. So before I move on, I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop of who I am and how I became financial literate. I was a 12-year corporate worker bee soldier for the National Basketball Association. Uh, it was a thankless job. <laughs> I worked 50, 60 hours a week. I lived paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and I had very little savings, low credit score. And I basically had no sustainable escape plan. And then on March 13, 2017, I was fired immediately on the spot. Not because of my work ethic because of what I post on my social media pages, which deals with the upliftment of African people through information and education. So this took me back to the nature of the question I asked in my first video of this channel. What would you do if you showed up on a Monday? What would be the first thing you think about if you lost your job? And basically that was my situation. I had to think about my money. And in thinking about my money, I was basically taken onto the path of financial literacy. And from that, I was able to create the Crypto World Financial Sustainability Movement. Within six months of applying what I learned in financial literacy, I went to mapping out a living financial sustainable plan. I cleared $20,000 in debt and increased my credit limit plus $35,000. I raised my credit score more than 150 points. I lowered my credit utilization rate from 80% to 15%. And I created an intergenerational wealth plan for my bloodline. 70 years into the future, but this wasn't enough. I felt it was important that I actually had to share this with the demograph that needs it most, Pilates. So here's the deal. If you're like me, you want financial security, and you also want a reliable and sustainable savings plan. So from this, I created the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Master Online Course where I work with you and show you money methods that are used to enable you to live off your savings and investments without having to pick up new employment and in actuality put you in a position to fire your boss, eliminating the anxiety of job or wage loss. This program is broken into five modules. The first being assessing your debt. The second one will learn how to leverage our credit. The third will eliminate this debt. The fourth module goes into intergenerational wealth planning and the last being communal cooperatives. This is for you if you depend on a job to sustain yourself. This is also for you if your income does not allow you to leave your job. You may have to maintain a second job just to make ends meet. This is also for you if you know something's not right but don't know how to address it. And lastly, if you're willing to make the short-term sacrifices necessary to guarantee long-term financial gains and freedom. So if you like what you heard today, be sure to hit that like button. And to learn more, go to CryptoWokeMovement.com. That's CryptoWokeMovement.com. So you might ask the question, what is CryptoWoke? Well, in the word, you might hear the word crypto. But I want to be clear. The CryptoWoke Financial Sustainability Movement is not about cryptocurrency. What we're talking about, when you look at the etymology of the word crypto, you find the word cryptic. And cryptic actually means hidden. So what we're talking about is using cryptic or hidden money methods used by wealthy families over 200 years that has enabled them to continue to make intergenerational wealth. My mission is broken into two phases. Phase one consists of getting 300 people financially literate and on the path of sustainability. And phase two is to move those 300 people towards physical and virtual cooperative communities 
creating intergenerational, economic, ecological, and cultural resuscitation and preservation by way of joint endeavors. Now, what does that mean? That basically means if I can get my money situation right and you have your money situation right, instead of buying a home, we can buy a block. Instead of starting a small local business, we can create an enterprise on a global level. I will be posting more videos on financial literacy. So if you like this type of information, be sure to subscribe. If you like today's video, hit that like button. And also be sure to hit that bell so you'll be notified when I post new videos up. So join the movement, the Crypto Woke Financial Sustainability Movement, where you can live the life of your choosing, living off your savings and investments. Change not only your future, but your bloodline.